All right, welcome to Mycroft's DevSync on July 23rd. So let's get started again with the same format we tried uh, earlier this week. And we'll uh, start with the good and the bad and the ugly, uh, starting with Chris Vare today. Hey, you're muted. That's the bad. <laughs> Uh, no. So the good, uh, I was able to um, put together a Confluence document um, with the options for Wi-Fi setup and how we want to, some decision points on how we want to uh, make that decision internally. I was also able to contribute to the uh, get document get started about the, uh, the GUI uh, decision and how we're going to make that. Um, and um, I started working on um, an issue with uh, with the Kiwi UI um, before I was abruptly pulled away from my home and and now my parents' house. So my productivity has been not great the last two days. That's the ugly. Um, I'm here helping out my family, so I'm doing what I can. But it's uh, it's not as much as I I would be doing if I was at home. So. <laughs> um, that's that's that. I'm some. I'm after the documentation. I think I'm going to pull some Selene tickets since I don't have a device right now. I'll do some uh, Selene work so that I can do that without a device. Some of those bug fixes, um, and then I'll get back on device when I get home. Okay, great. Uh, how long are you planning on being there, or do you think you might be there? Um, right now, it's open ended. I'm hoping to leave to, to go home Sunday, but it's not for sure yet. Okay. All right, thanks. Uh, Gez? Uh, yeah, um, so as Chris mentioned, I um, started the wife, uh, the GUI thing, um, uh, but I'll leave that for a separate discussion. Um, also, we've, we've shifted the, the TV image to be um, USB bootable. Um, but I think Derek will probably go into the details there. Um, there is a, to get it working, there was a little bit of messing around, but um, just because we're working off an existing image, I think if we um, build future images um, specifically on a USB, then we won't have the same problem. Um, it's just because the usable space on two different drives doesn't necessarily match up. Um, uh, other good things, uh, well, the other good thing is, um, the boot stuff that I've been looking into, uh, it turns out that sometimes some of our services just don't start up. Um, so the Mycroft dot ready message that reports. I guess this is not a good, it's good that I discovered it, but um, the Microsoft ready message that gets sent out to say that Microsoft is ready um, doesn't actually check the majority of the services that run Microsoft. It, it sort of assumes that, things, that the other things are running. It, it's really just saying that the skill service is running um, and the message bus because it has to receive the message. So you and doesn't that come like audacious or something too? Some some place weird. Uh, yeah, it comes from Pedacious. Yeah, yeah. So That's it's like that was kind of strange. It's a chain of events, and then based on that chain of events, you assume that everything in that chain is running. Um, but it, it really begs the um, well suggests that a, a shift so that we're either like having an external monitoring something that says you know, that checks in with each of the services and, and waits for them all to be, you know, properly booted and running and then says Microsoft's ready um, or, you know, something internal that, that checks on that as well. Um, so the good thing is that uh, OK has already been um, working on service hooks. Um, so hooks within each of the services to, you know, say that uh, things are booting, things are having that there's been an error on on startup or that you know everything started successfully. Um, it doesn't some of them have watchdogs, some of them don't. Um, so 
yeah, that all needs, uh, I'm basically at the moment in the process of figuring out what that might look like um, from a boot perspective. So Better. just FYI, I'd probably classify that as an ugly issue rather than a good one. Uh, in that <laughs> yeah, you've yeah. just discovered a giant uh, spaghetti mess of work to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sorry, I like to stay positive. The good part was that I found out that it's happening. <laughs> Um, right. Because it also it also um, highlighted why the the news and play fields just randomly failed in voice comp sometimes um, because I was able to replicate that um, when the audio service um, doesn't start uh, that happens because there's nothing to stop um, there's no playback to stop because there's no audio service um, and so uh, you know finding out why these seemingly random events are occurring is, is really good as well. Yeah, but that again, is good. ugly. Agreed. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that's good. That explains uh, some things. And, and yeah, getting a better definition on what ready means, I think, is, is a great step forward. Yeah. So uh, is, it, is uh, this something that you urgently need to work on? Um, I mean, are you going to add it to the bug bug list and, and keep cranking on it? Or do you, you want to set it aside in favor of other things? Well, I feel like it's actually it, it's actually causing, I've kind of pulled together maybe like four tickets, um, which I think is probably, are probably related um, based on this. And that, you know, will at least be a huge step forward if they can be, they're all relying on knowing that Microsoft's ready to do something. Um, and so it okay. feels like a priority. Okay. Yeah. All right, anything, uh, anything else? Uh, just the final thing um, is particularly in terms of bringing in uh, community um, PRs and stuff. Um, uh, I think, and I had a little bit of a chat to Chris about this, um, it would be really useful to document what we think goes where um, and, you know, what should be in Microsoft Core, what should be in an enclosure, what should be in a, a separate plugin. Um, and in my mind, ideally, we have Core being as minimal uh, as possible so that it is, it is literally the core. And then, you know, you can compose uh, Microsoft instances, you know, based on a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, and so there is some movement in this kind of direction um, with like a, a plug-in system for the audio services and, and that sort of thing. Um, but I think we'll probably need to wait till 2008 to actually put it into production because it's a big shift. Okay. Yeah, I'd want to review whatever OK is coming up with too to, to do like, I know we've, I like the idea of having some sort of service running that monitors our other services. We, I had that at another company that worked out really well as far as, you know, mm. so the services themselves aren't self-aware, but something's watching them. But um, I do want to, I don't know how to say this diplomatic, I, I, I appreciate OK's help, and I, and, but I don't want him to necessarily be go off and doing things that may or may not be aligned with what we want to do long-term architecturally, right? <laughs> Yeah, and so that's why, yeah, I think we need to, to be able to articulate what we want to do architecturally so that we can help the community to know which direction we want them to go. Um, so OK hasn't, hasn't worked on that external monitoring service at all. Um, so this is a prime time to, for us to get into that. Um, so I think if we can outline what we think that might look like, that would be really helpful. Um, so maybe Chris, you and I can chat about that. Um, and yeah. I won't just dive straight into it. Yeah, I can, uh, I can lend some input from when we had that kind of thing at another job I was at and how it worked. Yeah. All right. Cool. Awesome. All right. Uh, so. Oh, I did want to add that I, I got the volume issues fixed on the uh, on the new image. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I was able to add that uh, uh, I2C set command into the boot set set, and I was able to make sure that the uh, that the Mark II uh, skill that's running does have volume controls on it. So the current image shouldn't have a, a problem anymore with um, potentially blowing speakers. I did get to that done before I left. All right. Um, so uh, does that set like the max volume? 
like like the user can't turn it up past that number kind of thing? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Um, all right. So I put some information on that bug you, you wrote up. Yeah. I put some information there about that oh, as okay. well. I didn't see that update. Thanks. All right. Uh, let's go to Ken next. Sure. So, uh, yes, yeah, good, good work because I was going to tell you guys, I mean, I didn't want to say anything because I'm busy right now. <laughs> I don't want to get pulled into it. But I monitor the log files constantly on precise on uh, on Mycroft Core and Mycroft, and uh, I'm constantly seeing the, the message bus message come out and saying, you know, I'm done booting, right? And then for another 30 seconds to a minute, I see a bunch of activity, and I'm like, well, if you're done, what are you doing? So <laughs> I think you're on the right uh, track there. Anyway, um, all right, so the good. Uh, the good is the uh, database that uh, represents the large data store of samples has been backed up. The large store of samples is in process. It's a little over halfway through a 36-hour process. Uh, it's all good. Um, analyzed the uh, data and uh, wrote code to delete the offensive data um, when I get that marching order, which I got. So that'll be taken care of by end of day tomorrow, probably. Um, I started looking at how I'm going to partition that data and wrote some code to do so. Um, and I have some details on that. And I'll update the wiki because that's usually the, the, the most efficient way to get that com information communicated rather than spending an hour on the phone with everybody or on the call with everybody. Uh, I created a hyper uh, parameters document in Wiki. I think that's good because I surfaced some stuff and was able to learn some industry standard ratios between some of those hyper parameters and what drives their usage. And so that will help me reduce the tuning, uh, which could have been a combinatoric nightmare. So that was good. Um, I have some questions for Matt regarding some hyperparameters that are gathered in the later versions of Precise and not the earlier versions, but don't seem to be used. And I have refactored the um, latest version of Precise to include the hyperparameters from a command line so that the test suites can be implemented and generate CSV result files that can then be analyzed. Um, and possibly even make some inroads into auto-tuning, auto but uh, that's still down uh, the road a piece. And uh, what is this change? Oh yeah, and I'll change a bit based upon some of the uh, stuff I've learned. Uh, the bad was, uh, and, and ugly was really just that we didn't have that data backed up and it's gonna take quite a while to do so. Um, but other than that, nothing really bad or ugly, just uh, a lot of work and, and a lot of work to do, but, you know, starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, you know, the, the bad is, okay, the bad is, if you want to surface anything bad that I've discovered, we've got three distinct versions of Precise we have to be concerned about. We have version 0 0.1, which is the ver version that produced our current production model. We have version 0 0.2, which is what's installed in everybody's system. And 0 0.3, which is what you get if you check it out from the code line. Uh, and also, I believe, what is being deployed to the um, Mark IIs. So um, they are not backward compatible. Um, you know, a model created by O3 cannot be read or worked with by O2 or O1. Um, uh, how far up the chain that will work uh, or propagate, I'm not sure yet. I'm pretty sure models created by 0 0.1 can be handled by 0 0.3, but that's ugly and I have to get a handle on that and figure out what we're gonna do about that. I have been reluctant to upgrade because it'll affect the thousands of users that we have out there who are running 0 0.2. And if it's not necessary, I won't do it. Um, so I'm just trying to get a handle on that ugliness, and that's the only ugliness I guess I have to report. Okay, thanks. Derek. Um, just quickly, Mark 2 should be using Precise 2 as well. Uh, are you sure about that? Because last time I spoke with OK, he had mentioned he was running 0 0.3 with a modified 0 0.2 runner. Uh. I, I trust okay then. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know for sure either uh, on a Mark II. When I get one and it's installed, I'll be able to tell you. Well, we should be able to look at the images we're producing, right? 
Yeah, I'm not part of that process, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I can I can dig into it. Okay. Yeah. It depends on what Mark II you're talking about, too. In the Mark II that OK is work, was working on in his house was different than the one we produced for Project Rural Order, which is different than it's, um, Well, there you go. There's one to lose. <laughs> the one we did for Project Rollover is based off of Pycroft. So whatever Pycroft is using is what Project Rollover is using. Yeah, we, gotta, we have to be careful what we say. <laughs> but I have to qualify when we say Mark II, because there's about five versions of a line around out there. <laughs> Yeah, and at some point, and Michael, if you want to cut a ticket for this, I'm fine with that. We can just make it a low priority. I should probably put some sort of uh, table together which defines default versions with which ver with which image and, you know, all that good stuff. Yeah, I think we do need to look into that just in terms of what we can do. Uh, I'm less concerned with, you know, the end flavors of, you know, prototypes out there that have different versions of precise or whatever in them. Uh, but I am very concerned with the production stuff that's out there, the Mark 1s, you know, can they even be upgraded to, you know, version 3 and that kind of stuff. So, uh, but yeah, we should definitely create a ticket for that. Uh, okay, now Derek. All right, hey guys. Okay, uh, so I guess we'll start with the ugly. Um, project rollover uh, prototypes um, are a little behind schedule. Um, yeah, we just we ran into a couple of, couple blockers. I think Monday is probably doable to ship. Um, I think the most important one is just not really being able to test it until today. Um, you guys mentioned that we got the USB boot going. Thank you, guys, and um, Chris too on the pointing towards the rotation of the display. So that's awesome, that's working successfully, but we really didn't get any test anything until uh, today. All is looking okay, but I saw some of those audio issues that um, I wanna figure out what's going on there. And I haven't 100% de determined that it is software yet, so I need to swap out some parts and do some testing uh, to, make, to make sure it's not the, the hardware that's causing the problem before I point my finger at you guys. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I think it'd be, it would be too rushed to try and ship tomorrow with those, um, those concerns. Plus we still have, um, a lot of assembly left to do. The good news is we've got a lot of the, all, all the parts as of the end of today should be printed. Um, and Charlie's working hard to get everything all cleaned up and ready to go. So. There's really just going to be assembly and testing left to do. Um, so, but I do plan on running, if I get everything working well, uh, if we can determine what this I2C audio issue is, um, then I'm, I plan to leave on running over the weekend uh, to really make sure it's, it's good. Um, just preliminary heat tests, getting around 95 to 100 degrees when you're, um, hitting the top of the, de the device, which seems kind of hot, but it's really not that bad. When you Is touch that Celsius it. Um, or Fahrenheit? Fahrenheit. Just for, for reference, an Amazon product is about 90 degrees on top surface as well. So I think it's fine and uh, the pie isn't shutting down or anything like it you know would do if it were overheating. Um, but I'm gonna do, do some more rigorous stuff on that tomorrow. Um, yeah, so yeah, we probably, um, I don't know, Josh, we need to communicate that to, to the project rollover guys, um, for what we've, we've actually promised. Um, so that's that, uh, and then on, and that's really just been kind of taking up more time than I, than I thought. So I've made a little progress on, the, um, the new, um, SJ-based, uh, SJ-201-based enclosure, um, but uh, really not, not enough to, to make any noise about yet. So just been um, mostly working on the project rollover bits. Oh yeah, and there's some things I haven't mentioned about it that are kind of cool that you guys will probably wish you had on your um, three-speaker prototypes. 
uh, you can actually plug the Ethernet cable in and use the device with uh, with an Ethernet cable plugged into it. Uh, that's why the display had to be rotated 180 because it's now exposed towards the bottom. You have access to the USB ports. And the one thing that I know you guys have been bugging me about forever uh, is you can really truly remove the flash drive without any tools. <laughs> so uh, the USB, with, with, by switching to the USB stick, you can actually grab it and remove it. So um, unfortunately, that's probably the last the last of those types of prototypes that we'll make. But, you know, got a couple things fixed up for those guys uh, that are better than, than, than are known issues that we had in the past. So. Any, right. Yeah, that's it. That, that's it for me then. <clears throat> okay. Nothing blocking any of your work going forward? Um, no, I don't, just okay. those, those kind of setbacks. I mean, unless, unless, and then you kind of to, to be determined on this ITC issue uh, right. to see what's going on there. Uh, okay. How's the, um, I noticed Charlie's not here today. Is he, uh, everything's going yeah, fine I'm, on his front? I told him to jump on. I saw him at, I I was working with him up till about um, 3.30. Okay. And I don't know, he's probably just heads down working on the prototype. So um, everything is going fine there. Okay. Uh, great. Uh, well, let's see. I've only got a little bit of an update. Uh, we're going to talk with Kevin this afternoon and uh, finalize the order for the SJ201 prototypes. So we'll get those underway. I'll let you guys know what to expect in terms of timeline, uh, which brings me to the point of, uh, hey, we need to figure out how we're going to test these things. So I've created an epic in the ticket system to uh, you know, just list all the things we need to do to get a new enclosure up and running. It's not terribly different from the last one, but it is using a different chipset, and there's you know uh, there are things gonna, that are going to be different. So um, I pass that off to Chris to get started on. I just list you know just create tickets for all the things that need to be done on a new enclosure. Um, I'm going to work with Kevin to just create some test software for the device itself because. It can work in a standalone format as a USB device, so uh, so I think we'll test it that way to start with. Um, let's see, there's a, a number of topics that we talked about last week uh, that um, we need to put on our roadmap at some point. Uh, the one of them that so we talked about the GUI decision matrix, the Wi-Fi decision matrix, coming up with. Uh, we need to talk about the Mark II update methodology. We, I think we're going to have a decision matrix about that as well. And oh, the one I didn't get around to writing. I got the okay. Gotcha. <laughs> That's next. All right, cool. Um, and then the next thing I want to talk about is uh, it start to put together some uh, metrics for precise and try to set an end goal in terms of how do we know when, when it's good enough, right? I think we could, you know, there's a couple of ways we could do this. Uh, I'm open to ideas, but, you know, we could benchmark, you know, the Amazon, Google products in terms of how accurate they are, missed, missed wake word, like just, just basically, you know, how often they recognize the wake word and, and uh, come up with some crude targets. And uh, that might be one methodology. Uh, we can also target it, uh, you know, uh, a system whereby we just make sure that it's better than the last model we released, right? You know, stuff like that. We need to have uh, some criteria for you know when to release it and how to release it, right? I know that there's an, a, a fair amount of uncertainty regarding, you know, the new model versus the old model, and the old model's been around for a couple of years now, it hasn't been updated. So, uh, so if we did roll out a new model, it might change the way it behaves for some people. So maybe we want to roll out a new model as the sort of the default, hey, Mycroft model. And but keep the other one around as one of those alternate models, like the, you know, just call it Hey Mycroft slash Legacy or something like that, uh, in the in the Cellini options where you can pick a new wake word, right? Um, so we need we need to come up with that methodology. So that's that's something I'd, I'd like to talk to you about, Ken. Um, or you know, actually, ideally, you just come up with a proposal. Okay. Yeah, I'm gonna. 
I want to find out. Does anybody know this, the answer to this question before I ask Matt? Um, we automatically <clears throat> download the latest version of Precise uh, when Minecraft Core comes up. Uh, so each time you bring it up, it actually checks, checks to make sure you have the latest version that's been released. Um, if that process is in place for the model as well, then it, this should be a relatively painless process. So that's what I'm going to ask Matt, unless anybody else here knows the answer to that question, which is, is there a way to say in the cloud, here's, here's the new model, and then all the devices will automatically update. Does anybody know if that's in there or not? Okay. Uh, I'm Matt. fairly sure it is. I can, I'll check the code and message you. Okay, thanks. And yeah, Michael, I'll work on the um, pseudo acceptance criteria. Um, probably it'd be multi-staged, which will be internal uh, analysis, like you mentioned, against competitive products and against our previous version and against a known data set. But then there should probably be some sort of staged rollout, uh, maybe just among us, to say, yeah, it seems, it seems better or it doesn't seem worse. Uh, in other words, I'm anticipating a jump from about 85% recognition accuracy to 95% with the next model. I don't know how you quantify to a human, this is 10% better at recognizing wake words. I call, I call bullshit on both of those numbers. Okay. You're missing wake words that people are attempting to use and are not being recognized. I would be stunned if our actual accuracy was more than 30%. <laughs> well, prove, prove me wrong. No, I don't want to quantify the statement. I'm not, I'm not disagreeing with you a bit. The statement is simply against a known test data set that I have assembled that is balanced between male and female or high and low pitched voices. Um, against that known data set is where those numbers are derived from. And that data set may be as small as 500 samples. So, yes, in the wild, the numbers are probably vastly different, Josh. I, I just don't know how to quantify in the wild numbers. I only know how to bring it into the lab and quantify. Right, and that's that's actually right. another topic. More, more things from the wild in, right? <laughs> well, that that is one issue. It's, you know, getting more samples from the wild could potentially help with that, but also characterizing the nature of the samples that we're getting and that we have and that we're training against and testing against. You know, like. If I'm, I'm using a headset, my recordings are going to be a little bit cleaner than if I'm talking into the microphone on my webcam, right? And yeah, this is, a, this is a big issue, which is, I don't know the answer, by the way, which is, are we better served with clean data or are we better served with dirty data? In other words, is it better that the data has normal noise in the background because that's what the recognizer is going to be exposed to on a daily basis? Or, or is it better to deal with really tight, clean yes. data. Yeah. What's the SQ, Josh? Which, which, which one? Dirty data. It's actually one of the reasons we didn't get into fancy microphones with the Mark I. The concept was we want to collect data in a dirty environment and teach the wake word recognizer to recognize that environment and then solve the dirty in software so that we're not hobbled by a need to have these super clean noise cancellation chips on every instance of Mycroft. If it'll run on a Mark I, it should run anywhere, was kind of the thinking. That's fair, that's fair. That, that we have no problem with. Most of them, we do have a lot of dirty data. So, and I haven't cleaned it up, which just lets me know that I shouldn't bother building a noise classifier and filtering those out. Thanks, Josh. And, and as, part of the, as part of this, you know, what does Precise look like when it's done? I would argue that unless we have the entire machine learning loop um, closed and finished, that the project's not done. What I really like to avoid, and my phone's about to die, so if I leave, that's why. Um, I'd really like to avoid a situation where we're back where we are today a year from now. Like Ken moves on and we need to train more models and we haven't automated this loop. I'd love to, the completion for me would be the software stack is automatically improving as we collect more data with the contributions from the community, right? At which point we can close this, this item and the, the, it should improve by itself. Right? Like we shouldn't have to continue to develop additional software beyond 
tweaking how the models are trained and whatnot, which, you know, you'd be surprised at how many members of our community are willing to reach in and do that piece of it for us. Yeah, I think I agree with all of the above. The only caveat would be that at some point, and I, I suspect we're still a ways off from that point, we'll have too much data and we'll, and we'll start overfitting. But I suspect that's not an issue, and I hear where you're, com where you're coming from, Josh. Uh, I will work on, I am working actually on exactly that, which is the entire loop from getting the, uh, the new samples into the system, getting them into a business process flow where they can be manually validated, getting them into the training and testing data sets from there, and periodically uh, at some trigger level, retraining models and then running the whole suite in is this model better than the previous model? Uh, and then yes, if it is, it automatically gets deployed. Yes, I hear you and that's what I'm working on from a high level, correct? Excellent, and I'd, I'd like to abstract that one step above, um, and that would be that we can re-implement that exact same loop for new WakeWorks in some kind of automated fashion. In other words, if we want to stand up a WakeWord, hey Jarvis, for example, um, we can add that to Celine, and anybody who selects it will automatically start feeding data into that exact same loop for the new WakeWord. And so that would enable us, as we have uh, corporate customers step up and want to do custom wake words, we could simply enable one in Celine, let the community know, hey, we need help. We have some prizes available for whoever tags the most of these queries, and it would stand up and improve on its own, right? That's that's a very powerful position to be in on the wake word side. Um, Kit AI sold to Baidu for $50 million, and they didn't have anything even close to this. Yeah, no, you're a man after my own heart. I agree. Uh, so yeah, that's uh, the goal. And I am okay, going. The only other piece I'd, I'd like to abstract up is I want to make sure that we are collecting the data from before the wake word so we can start getting the missed ones. Right now, the entire system is biased towards the ones we actually spotted. We need to be collecting the attempts that don't work because without those, our accuracy will always be shit. That, that's fair enough. Michael, can you cut a ticket for me for that? Um, and uh, yeah, that'll be one of the last things I do once I have the loop closed. But yeah, I absolutely agree with everything Josh said. Uh, just to be clear, Josh, I ain't going nowhere. Uh, this is my dream job. I could become a splotch on the side of the road, though, which is why I keep creating the wiki pages. <laughs> yeah, keep, keep wearing the mask. Don't go to the grocery store. I, yeah, I, I'm not sure that... Like in terms of getting in data for people that we're not um, successfully hitting, uh, it feels like the precise trainer skill is a much stronger way of doing that than messing with audio from before they've even spoken to the device. Like I feel like that in itself has privacy concerns and people will be, yeah. I mean, we're deliberately, we're, we're deliberately having people, you know, we're, we're communicating what we're doing with it. But unless we get those missed utterances, we don't know what our accuracy is. If my kid tries five times and on the sixth time it works, our accuracy is 18%. But, you know, we don't know. But a lot know of the times if your kid tries five times, they don't bother trying the sixth time. And so then we don't get it at all. On the yeah, Mark 1, they can that. hit the button. And on the Mark 2, they should be able to hit the button, too. Well, let's just let's just leave it at this: that uh, Chris's uh, concerns are noted, and we probably, when we have our privacy policy discussions, need to surface this and, and get it out there. But I agree with Josh that that it, that information is a potential way for us outside of manual intervention to gather some of that data and improve. Um, in other words, the value of that data is, especially in the case where it was. Uh, a missed wake word, the val or or you know, in either case, that 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 data is very valuable. In other words, if I have um, samples that say, "Hey, Minecraft," uh, it would be wonderful if I could have samples that in the negative side that said, "Hey, Minecraft," because it allows the uh, tighter discrimination during the training process. So, this gives us the opportunity to get some of that data uh, in an automated fashion. So, if we can overcome the privacy concerns, which I agree are existent. I think this data is a bit valuable and not that hard to capture. 
I, I don't view it as a privacy concern at all. For me, the privacy issue is binary. Like either the person opted out, opted in, or they did. And so the, the you know, on, on the privacy side of things, the, uh, the end user should, um, you know, we've informed them what we want to do with their data. You know, we've been upfront about it. They've consented. At that point, we need to stop being nuanced. We collect what we need to make the software stack go. And if they're uncomfortable with it, they'll opt out, we'll nuke it. But, you know, we, we can't continue to have these nuanced discussions about it. We, you know, once somebody's consented, let's go ahead and use the data because our competitors are using everything, right? They're using everything. So you know, they're collecting 10 seconds before, 10 seconds after everything you say in the room, like they're collecting everything. We can, you know, once we've, disclose to people what we're doing with it once we've asked their permission and they've affirmatively granted it let's go ahead and and use the data we need it but, you know we, we don't want to be so far on the side of privacy that we can't build a technology stack that's competitive and works nobody wants that right and you know yeah, we can I, add I tools we can add tools to the system that allow people to go in and selectively nuke samples or whatever so. yes that's what i would i would ask for because i i think that people and this, I mean, from personal experience, seeing some of the data and seeing some stuff that I'm like, yeah, I don't think I'd want that out there if it were mine. Um, you know, I don't. That's a really people... sexy option. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. No, it is because it allows the use. It's a little bit difficult to implement, but it gives the user fine-grained control, so that we don't get gross opt-outs. We can get just whack these ten files of mine. That that's awesome. Because there's this issue, we are still sm a small enough community, and I've always seen stuff when looking at data, we're like, hey, I know who this person is. Like, you know, and that's that's a little weird. So, uh, and that could, I mean, that could obviously happen within the company, but I think it could also happen within our close-knit community. Um, and yeah, there should be some thought into it. And not everybody knows what it means when you say we're gonna use your data to improve the wake word. They might be like, okay, cool. I don't care how many times you listen to me say, hey, my crop, I'll say, hey, my crop a million times for you. They don't realize that it's that it's actually more than that. And so I just think we need to have some optics on it. We understand like it, it could be a problem, um, but, uh, but I like the idea of being able to listen to your own data and be able to nuke it uh, if you don't like, like what you hear. <laughs> right. And, uh, you know, to Josh's point, I think, you know, they give consent, then they've given consent, right? Uh, I think it needs to be informed consent. And, you know, to Derek's point, we, we should be very clear about what we're collecting with them. And, and as we change what we collect, if we do, we either need to get, you know, new, a new consent or make it really clear to them that things have changed. So, uh, but yeah, all these uh, issues are addressable and we should not be afraid to collect data when people want us to collect their data and use it to make the system better. So, yeah, right. I think I fully agree with all that. I, th I think my, my concern is that if doing that particularly without a way for people to actually see exactly what they're uploading, um, we'll just see a huge drop off in, in opt-in because I mean, I, I wouldn't opt-in at that point in time and, you know, so I imagine that a lot of other people wouldn't as well. Yeah, I mean, we could even potentially implement a, um, you know, a system where you say like, hey, Mycroft, you know, uh, forget everything I said for the last hour. Yeah. Then, yeah, yeah. then so we don't need a GUI for it. Things. They don't need to log and into Selenium, you know. And we could even, you know, we can look at more granular opt-in controls potentially rather than just a single opt-in opt-out like some people might be happy for wake words and not utterances and yada 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 like this is what um come from people as well you know they're like well i don't actually know what data you're collecting so therefore i opt out but if i could see the data before it goes up then i'd be happy to, to do that or if i could you know even if i could review it after it's already gone up um then they'd be more happy with it. So that, like, there's a whole lot of nuance here. We just, we're just not in a position where we can actually build that nuance in, so, yeah. Yeah, and what might be cool is having a skill that responds to uh, stop collecting, start collecting again. 
And then what you have is a marketable yeah. feature that your competitors don't have. You can't tell Google, stop opting my data in, or Amazon, you can't say, hey, stop recording my data, you know, and then later you can say, stop, start again. That would be a marketable uh, thing, that, you know, that we could uh, trumpet out there regarding a benefit over our competitors and privacy issues. So, I, I, yeah, I think that's awesome. I think we could also have a, a tool um, that allows people to, that we can load the Wake Recognizer onto some sort of web interface where people can, you don't have to have a Mark One or a Mark Two to do it. You can just go on there and say, hey, Mycroft, and if the Wake Recognizer says, boop, yep, I recognize you, oh, that's a positive. If you tried it and it didn't say that, and it, you know, there's, you don't, so that way, and, that, and if you opt into, and if you do that, then you automatically ask, you know, maybe there's an agreement before you do it that says, okay, I, I agree that my samples are, you know, can be used for our data purposes. But that gives people a way, not only they make it, they can almost, you can almost self tag at that point too. You know, you could just, yeah. yeah. You know, and, and, I mean, I know we talked about, can we give us 20 samples, for example? I know we talked about maybe having a cap on how useful it is for one person to have too many samples, but. You know, if we put it behind our single sign-on and people sign on and say, okay, I've given my 20, then, you know, and they're validated. It would also help us with the false positives too, because they, they'll know right away that they tried to say and it didn't work, so. Yeah, I'm, I'm really I'm really big on skill that, um, you know, hey, uh, you know, turn off opt-in, turn on opt-in. I mean, I can tell you several times during the day where my wife comes in and aggravates me and I would be using that skill and saying, turn it off opt-in. And then when I was done with her, turn it back on again. So yeah, I, I'm, I'm liking that concept. Yeah, so then we just need the event, we need the event driven um, database, like the transactional database on that opt-in flag before we do that sort of thing. Yeah, that's true. I had some thoughts too on uh, this going back on the conversation a little bit, but on our kind of real world testing aspect of it, um, as soon as we get some of these SJ 201s, um, might be cool to write something that allows us to do some automated testing, especially if you had two of them, uh, that you could run like wake word samples on one device at different decibel levels and you know move your other device back away from it and do some benchmarking um, with the real physical device. We did something similar to that with the Mark I oh, over a year ago versus an Amazon device um, and a Google device where we, you know, on a speaker played at different decibel levels, we played wake words and tested uh, distances and volumes, and et cetera. Um, so obviously that's not gonna get you the huge breadth of, of um, you know, examples that you get from the community, but it could give you some pretty useful real world data pretty quickly. Uh, you bring up a really good point, which is, um, I don't know if we've been looking at this. When we were getting ready to release the PC Junior at IBM, uh, I was working uh, closely with the human factors guys at the time on a different project and they showed me an issue they had uh, the PC Junior actually got recalled initially because the keyboards were infrared and nobody had thought to put two PC Juniors side by side. And what happened was the keyboards interfered with each other and screwed everything up and had to be redesigned. Have we taken and put two Microsofts, a Alexa, and a Google Voice Assistant, and maybe even a Siri in the same room, and done a battle of the network speaker phones and see what happens? We've done it. I've got three or four on my desk at the moment. <laughs> yeah, I mean, in our Gladstone office, we have a Google Home and an Alexa, and you know, we usually leave them muted. But I mean, we've we've done. We had a, a guy who was doing metrics for a while who actually you know sat in a room with all three of them and collected some metrics on that, on that kind of stuff. So I think I mean, we have some of that data lying around, but um, it wouldn't hurt to do it more often. Every now and again, when you get really lucky, they can get in the conversation together. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, so there's, that brings up another, that, that actually brings up another thing, uh, metrics wise, that could help us too with our um, Qt versus Kiwi, going back to that. Uh, one of those metrics was time to response. And that's like one of the, you know, the big things that uh, you want to be looking at, you know, with our product versus other assistants. Um, that to me is like the time of response between the two GUIs, that's, that's the first step. It's like, okay, if this, um, if one is, is vastly superior than the other, well then it's no brainer. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if, is any of that stuff that we did for those, I mean, I know there was at one point, uh, one of our employees was, you know, sitting in a room, you know, stopwatch in hand doing that kind of stuff, especially with the Amazon devices. We don't have a way to test that other, other than that. Um, we do at one point had, had some tests like that for Mycroft. Uh, we have metrics for Mycroft core that tell, say how long it took to get from point A to point B and those metrics are up in Grafana. Um, what we don't have is what type of device were you using when you did that? Um, not that that correlation is not there yet. So if we could add that correlation, you know, and then we could look, you know, we could do apples, you know, apples to apples comparison of, you know, how a skill reacts on different device types. Well, yeah, at least on the short term, if we could just do it on one, like per one device, <laughs> you know, if we just had this one instance of TV or this one instance of the cute devices, um, I mean, you, again, you can do this stopwatch in hand, but I was just curious. That was no. If you if you knew like if you were doing it yourself and you knew your account ID and the data, or you could tell me your account ID in the database and which device you were using that was the cute version, which was the Gibby version, we could I could get there. Um, you, without, could probably, you could probably get it from the log files in the message bus. Uh, log file time times are not necessarily the best way to view something like that because the files get written to the log. Not necessarily at the, you know, there's, a, there's read write problems. And I've had problems before, but looking at log file time um, stamps can really get you into trouble. Um, sure. sure. So, unless you actually have the log message has a sort of time stamp in the log message itself, <laughs> but I would look at the, you know, the time stamp the log message was written. Yeah, that, that you know, you're right, Chris. Um, we can, we can uh, Derek, we can put some code in place pretty quickly to, to run that test. Um, I think the yeah, code just, is there. We have a metric service in core. It's just a matter of, you know, you have to be opted in um, and you have to, I, we have to be able to know when you were using, um, with, you know, a Mark II Qt device and when you were using a Mark II Kibbe device, um, you know, or which, or which devices they are so we can identify them in, in the database. Once we have that, then I think we can make that correlation. I'll double check, but I don't think this is, I think a lot of the tools are in place for this. I think we just need to um, make that final step of doing the correlation. Yeah. All right. So um, I don't think we're at the point yet where we need to make a decision on the Qt versus Kivi. Uh, I think we should go through and make sure that we've, everyone's had a chance to put in their two cents on the decision criteria. Um, and we should be talking about that soon. Um, in terms of next week, um, how are we looking in uh, with our uh, with the bag of issues that we're calling a sprint? <laughs> um, so I did, like I said, I I, I, I um, closed a couple of the volume ones. Um, no, no, no. I mean, I don't mean you in particular. I mean, like uh, as a team overall. Like, do we need to? Is it time? Should we be looking at shifting focus to? Um, you know, to a new, uh, bigger project, or we still have a lot of work to do in terms of debugging. Um, so I think you know. the reason we're doing this is, is really project rollover, right? Is to get them as, as best user experience as possible. So I think the one thing we haven't done is to go through the, the bugs that are not, that haven't been started yet and say, okay, these would be really beneficial to get done, you know, quickly and these are maybe lower priority bugs that we should be doing something else inside instead of fi fixing this bug right away. Right. Okay. Um, that sounds like a useful exercise because the, the next two things that I want to talk about are in terms of overall, um, you know, projects that the team can work on 
um, I think that we can take the work that we're doing, you know, that Ken's primarily doing here on Precise, and expand that to be a team-wide effort because there are elements that everyone has some knowledge on that can really help move this forward. For example, if we're going to create a community, uh, you know, a system that involves the community submitting samples or grading samples and verifying and that sort of thing, then you know, I think uh, Chris can help do some of that work or get the community involved and and, and helping out with you know uh, improving that system, um, you know, and you know, obviously there's stuff work to be done on the Cellini side in terms of uh, you know, creating the infrastructure for that, both for collecting samples and for, you know, the opt-in and all that kind of stuff that we were recently talking about. So this this could be like a, a team-wide project that we could focus on, you know, get this wake word data collection system done, robust, and something that we can, you know, utilize going forward. And I think that'd be a, that'd be a, a great project for us to, to work on that would have lasting value and, and you know, potentially give us immediate results and, and improvements. So... Um, so that's one thing. Uh, the other thing is um, the the continuous um, revisit the continuous integration process and uh, and look at turning that into a continuous deployment process because you know right now we don't have we don't even have a deployment process for the Mark IIs because we don't have a Mark II, um, but we do have a snap package and we don't have a continuous deployment process for that really defined yet. Right. I don't know how often we're uh, updating the snap package, but um, uh, I installed the fresh copy yesterday, and uh, you know there were a couple of hiccups in getting it up and running, but um, but you know it's pretty easy to get installed, right? And so that's that's actually a system that we could be using um, as part of even the the WakeWord data collection system, right? Uh, because it's um, you know, it, it's right there in front of the user. Once you install it, like it's it's a really easy way to to get people to um, to interact with the system. And so, like if you know, if we had a skill, for example, that helped us collect wake words or grade wake words, I mean, even just spending a, a you know a, a human spending five minutes doing that could do a ton of work uh, for us, and uh, that'd be just super valuable. So, um, so having a continuous deployment process, I think, you know, would be really useful in that respect as well. So those are some of the next two projects that are on my mind. Uh, in terms of you know things we can get the team involved in, so uh, I yeah, want to I would really hate to waste the momentum we have mind precise right now. We've been we're, we're giving it more attention than we have in a while, and it's been an issue for a while. So it'd be it'd really be nice to you know to really put some nails in that coffin and say you know we've got this really cool wake word thing um, that is useful in many many different ways, um, and you know. And be able to have that kind of feather in our cap might be nice. Okay. Yeah, if we could get precise through to completion, right? So it's a production piece of software. It creates a lot of opportunities for us as a company. And I would argue that precise combined with the initial setup and the Wi-Fi setup, if we could get those two things squared away and then as icing on the cake, get the stack to be stable on whatever hardware we choose, we have a viable product that we can ship and actually like have some customers and some revenue and stop being behind the eight ball with fundraising that, that's a very powerful thing i would love to see that happen. and the other thing with the bug fixes is i mean i know that project rollover has a few prototype devices but really i mean we could have another bug fix um sprint once we get more of the sj201 prototypes out there so i'm sure there'll be a whole new set of bugs and we'll show up with the new with the new hardware um you know and make sure that you know, definitely, you know, at least don't send any of those out to anybody. And so we're, we're, we're happy with its, you know, performance um, from a UX perspective. Yeah, the, yeah, the, the hardware, the, the SA201 hardware is really, uh, you know, I consider it almost a Skunk Works project just to prove that we can do it and get something out there. And so we can start to test the efficacy of actually having an audio front end and start to deal with some of these issues of clean data versus dirty data. And what does that even mean if we're using, you know, uh, these acoustic echo cancellation you know, algorithms. Um, so, um, so I think that's a nice to have, but it's you know, and obviously we want to fulfill the Kickstarter, uh, yeah. you know, uh, commitments there. Uh, but um, yeah, but you know, we're not going to be able to do that until the software is ready anyway. So, 
Uh, I don't. Yeah. I don't want the hardware to become a distraction. Well, and I think precise is essential for the Mark II as well, right? Like, oh, of course. Yeah. 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 I even have to speak to Josh's point. I even have the beginnings of a precise studio that I'm building, that you can Ooh, you know, using the UI. Yeah, you can create your wake words. You can put, assemble your data sets. You can test your models, all that stuff, just using a uh, a GUI. So uh, that would install when you uh, checked out precise. Um, it's not that difficult. As, yeah. as much as possible, I'd like to make sure that the precise stuff runs through Selenium. Um, in terms of tagging and verifying and adding um, feature or adding new models, um, you know, being open source is great, and I, I, you know, am a thousand percent behind it. But let's not build tools that put ourselves where we put ourselves out of business. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I haven't even thought about those issues. That you guys will have to, you know, guide me on that. But yeah. Uh, for sure, um, this, the, the process currently does not go through Selene. Uh, we could make it go through Selene. It's it wouldn't be that difficult, I don't think. Well, I think I don't need to just from the opt-in. Creating the new wake words and all that yeah. stuff, so finding which ones you want to delete, and all of that stuff can run through Selene. And if, if a company, like a major retailer, wants to have that capability, you know, we can work with them for the community. We can provide it for them, but. You know, we are a company and not a charitable organization. We do need to come up with some mechanisms where we add value in exchange for getting paid or, you know, a, you know, we we will be not a company anymore after a while. <laughs> Agreed. So, so um, to get started, should we shape up a precise sprint? Uh, well, let's go through the current sprint. Uh, look for anything that's critical that we need to get done either for rollover or for just you know the system in general are there any critical issues in the to-do column and make sure we close those out um, and in the meantime yeah let's get started on defining a precise sprint uh, around you know building this whole the whole system uh, i'd like to see a precise epic and put all the tickets in there we can prioritize you know i think there's probably a lot of stuff that you know could be you know, same thing we're doing with the width of bug fixes now, which, you know, what do we want to maybe break it up into smaller sprints instead of one big, huge, like make precise work sprint. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Yeah, because we're going to have to define <laughs> all these elements, like the Selenium element, the data collection, you know, storage element, the, the training element, the how often do we, you know, uh, Ken's still working on the whole algorithm in terms of, you know, what's the best way to utilize the data, all that kind of stuff. So. There's, there's a lot of moving parts, so I agree. So how do, what's what's the best way to identify, I mean, who, which of these issues, do we, should we go through them as a group in a different meeting? Should we each take, I mean, I, I was thinking that, you know, there's a high priority, there's a priority flag on these issues. We could, you know, use that and set the set the, the ones to high that we think are are the most important. Maybe we all do that between now and Monday. Are you talking and, about the, uh current bug sprint or a new sprint? Yeah, the current bug fix sprint. Okay. And then we have a Monday, we can go through all the ones that have been marked as high. And, but then that would be hard to know if no, somebody missed one that somebody else thinks is high. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I'm, I'm trying to think of a, the best way for all of us to you know, have input on things that we think that really have to be fixed before we move on. I think that's fine. I mean, the tool's there. Why don't we use the priority? Just set it to high, or set it to highest if we have to fix it before we move, we close out this bug, bug fix sprint. Okay. All right. I'll... I mean, that shouldn't take more than five minutes. You know, everybody can go. Yeah, everybody, everybody first. make a pass through. And if it's not already marked as high priority, you think it should be, then go ahead and change the priority to highest. All right. And mm -hmm. then I, I think um, the way I'd like to proceed with creating the wake word sprint, uh, the precise sprint. Um, I think Ken's got a pretty good handle on the overall system in terms of, you know, the training and the collecting the data and that sort of thing. And, uh, and if he, so I'd like to see, you know, him write down like he's been doing with the confluence pages, just, you know, an overview of the whole system, how it behaves, how it, how the user interacts with it, that sort of thing. And that way we can all take a look at it and, uh, and make sure we're, all, you know, all in agreement about what needs to be done and how it should work. 
Okay, I'll I take that I'll take that as a uh, work item, and I'll try to have that document uh, available by meeting on Monday. I don't think we should use the meeting on Monday to review the document, so you know, okay. feel okay. free to do that uh, as as it's appropriate. Um, and yeah. we should have a, a separate we should have a separate uh, meeting to review it. Uh, in fact, know. actually, what we should do is we should review it offline. Like when you're done, send it around for people to comment on. Then we have a meeting to go over the comments and you know resolve anything that's not obvious no i agree i guess i'll rephrase it i'll, I'll i'm saying i'm going to try to have that page done and emailed out to everybody by monday that sounds awesome thanks okay any outstanding items that we need to talk about not here all right cool well thanks everybody uh, the meetings are not getting any shorter, but I think they're getting more focused, so I, I appreciate that. I agree. <laughs> Very cool. Hey, Gaz, I have a quick question for you before you go. Have you, uh, you say you have like two or three of them in the same room. Are they all on at the same time? Uh, was that for me? Yeah, uh, often they are, yeah. It kind of changes pretty regularly. Um, so you're on the same time, it doesn't create like an infinite like battle of the speaker phone and automated uh, calling system? Uh, it does sometimes, yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, that's, that's what I was afraid of. It's just constantly going to an infinite loop until somebody manually powers one down. Okay. <laughs> uh, no, no, no. They, they don't often get into an infinite loop, but, you know, you, um, you often get, you know, the same response from, from multiple places. Um, but it's also why we have multiple fake words. So, you know, you can have an Ezra and a Jarvis and a Mycroft and, um, you know, that helps you pick one rather than the other. That's what we do in the uh, yes. Gladstone offices. I use like, hey, Jarvis on my desk. So I don't, when I'm testing, I'm not <laughs> deactivating every other device in the office. Yeah, you should be able to put... You should be able to put them in an infinite loop by saying, hey, Mycroft, waiting for it to activate, and then say, "Say, hey, Mycroft, say, hey, Mycroft, twice. <laughs> and that should, put them, that should put them all into an infinite loop. Yeah. And just, just an FYI, of the data set I have already, I do have um, other, data, wake, other data for other wake words, and hey, Jarvis is one of them. Yeah, we've started some of that collection a while ago. We yeah. just never got all the way through with the tagging and all that stuff. So we just we need to be able to. I, I'd like to take whatever that Postgres database is and in, integrate it into Selenium as well, so we can take advantage of um, you know referential integrity and stuff. So that yeah, yeah, that's what I was saying. We want to get it integrated with Selenium. Not only that, but it's a MariaDB slash MySQL, not even Postgres. Uh, okay, well, yep. yeah. All right, okay. and then. And then at the end of that, that becomes a service that we can charge people money for, and then we can pay our own bills, which makes me very excited. Why are we yeah. worried about money? <laughs> hey, if you if everybody on this call can stop worrying about money, then we can stop worrying about money, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think Ken just volunteered his paycheck. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Everybody, I like these. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, uh, I will focus on continuing to go uh, get some money and uh, make sure we, we keep the uh, the bellies full. And uh, we'll talk How again. How am I going? Uh, uh, assuming we're not recording now. Oh, oh no, we're still recording. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, now they know we're recording. <laughs> yeah, so, so the community knows it's, it's no secret. We're getting ready to go out and raise some money. So uh, we, can, we can talk about that a little bit later. All right. We have multiple right. competing term sheets, and anybody listening to this call who wants to get in had better get the check in now. That's you right. Better get in on Monday. <laughs>